Chapter Eight, Part Two of the Brotherhood of the Seven Kings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Brotherhood of the Seven Kings by L. T. Meade and Robert Eustace. Chapter Eight: The Mystery of the Strong Room, Part Two. Out of an oblivion that might have been eternity, a dawning sense of consciousness came to me. I opened my eyes. The face of Dufrayer was bending over me. Hush, he said. Keep quiet, Head. Doctor, he added. He has come to himself at last. A young man with a bright, intelligent face approached my side. Ah, you feeling better? he said. That is right, but you must keep quiet. Drink this. He raised a glass to my lips. I drank thirstily. I noticed now that my left hand and arm were in a splint, bandaged to my side. What can have happened? I exclaimed. I had scarcely uttered the words before memory came back to me in a flash. "'You have had a bad accident,' said Dufrayer. "'Your gun burst.' "'Burst!' I cried. "'Impossible!' "'It is only too true. You have had a marvellous escape of your life, and your left hand and arm are injured.' "'Dufrayer,' I said at once, and eagerly, "'I must see you alone. Will you ask the doctor to leave us?' "'I will be within call, Mr. Dufrayer,' said the medical man. He went into the anteroom. I was feverish, and I knew it but my one effort was to keep full consciousness until I had spoken to Dufrayer. "'I must get up at once,' I cried. "'I feel all right, only a little queer about the head, but that is nothing. Is my hand much damaged?' "'No. Luckily it is only a flesh wound,' replied Dufrayer. "'But how could the gun have burst?' I continued. "'It was one of Riley's make, and worth seventy guineas.' I had scarcely said the last words before a hideous thought flashed across me. Dufrayer spoke instantly, answering my surmise. "'I have examined your gun carefully, at least what is left of it,' he said, "'and there is not the slightest doubt that the explosion was not caused by an ordinary cartridge. The stock and barrels are blown to fragments. The marvel is that you were not killed on the spot.' "'It is easy to guess who has done the mischief,' I replied. "'At least one fact is abundantly clear,' said Dufrayer. "'Your gun was tampered with, probably during the luncheon interval. I have been making inquiries, and believe that one of the beaters knows something, only I have not got him yet to confess. I have also made a close examination of the ground where you stood, and have picked up a small piece of the brasswork of a cartridge. Matters are so grave that I have wired to Tyler and Ford, and they will both be here in the morning. My impression is that we shall soon have got sufficient evidence to arrest Madame. It goes without saying that this is her work. This is the second time she has tried to get rid of you, and happen what may, the thing must be stopped." but I must not worry you any further at present, for the shock you have sustained has been fearful. Am I badly hurt? I asked. Fortunately, you are only cut a little about the face, and your eyes have altogether escaped. Dynamite always expends its force downwards. It is lucky my eyes escaped, I answered. Now, Dufrayer, I have just received some important information from Mrs. Carleton. It was told to me, under a seal of the deepest secrecy, and even now I must not tell you what she has confided to me without her permission— would it be possible to get her to come to see me for a moment? I am sure she will come, and gladly. She seems to be in a terrible state of nervous prostration. You know she was on the scene when the accident happened. When I appeared, I found her in a half-fainting condition, supported, of course, by Madame Colucci, whom she seemed to shrink from in the most unmistakable manner. Yes, I will send her to you, but I do not think the doctor will allow you to talk long. Never mind about the doctor or any one else, I replied. Let me see Mrs. Carleton. There is not an instant to lose." Dufrayer saw by my manner that I was frightfully excited. He left the room at once, and in a few moments Mrs. Carleton came in. Even in the midst of my own pain I could not but remark, with consternation, the look of agony on her face. She was trembling so excessively that she could scarcely stand. "'Will you do something for me?' I said in a whisper. I was getting rapidly weaker, and even my powers of speech were failing me. "'Anything in my power,' she said, "'except—' "'But I want no exceptions,' I said. "'I have nearly lost my life. "'I am speaking to you now, almost with the solemnity of a dying man. "'I want you to go straight to your husband and tell him all.' "'No, no, no!' she turned away. "'Her face was whiter than the white dress which she was wearing. "'Then, if you will not confide in him, "'tell all that you have just told me to my friend Dufrayer. "'He is a lawyer, well accustomed to hearing stories of distress and horror. "'He will advise you. Will you at least do that?' "'I cannot.' Her voice was hoarse with emotion. Then she said, in a whisper, "'I am more terrified than ever, for I cannot find the key of my jewel-case.' 
This makes matters still graver, although I believe that even Madame Colucci cannot tamper with the strong room. You will tell your husband or defrayer. Promise me that, and I shall rest happy. I cannot, Mr. Head, and you, on your part, have promised not to reveal my secret. You put me in a most cruel dilemma, I replied. Just then the doctor came into the room, accompanied by Carlton. Come, come, said the medical man. Mr. Head, you are exciting yourself, I am afraid. Mrs. Carlton, I must ask you to leave my patient. Absolute quiet is essential. Fortunately, the injuries to the face are trivial, but the shock to the system has been considerable, and fever may set in unless quiet is enforced. Come, Nora, said her husband. You ought to rest yourself, my dear, for you look very bad. As they were leaving the room, I motioned to Freyer to my side. Go to Mrs. Carlton, I said. She has something to say of the utmost importance. Tell her that you know she possesses a secret, that I have not told you what it is, but that I have implored her to take you into her confidence. I will do so, he replied. Late that evening he came back to me. Well, I cried eagerly, Mrs. Carlton is too ill to be pressed any further. Head, she has been obliged to go to her room, and the doctor has been with her. He prescribed a soothing draught. Her husband is very much puzzled at her condition. You look anything but fit yourself, old man, he continued. You must go to sleep now. Whatever part madam has played in this tragedy, she is keeping up appearances with her usual aplomb. There was not a more brilliant member of the dinner party to-night than she. She has been inquiring with apparent sympathy for you, and offered to come and see you if that would mend matters. Of course, I told her that the doctor would not allow any visitors. Now you must take your sleeping draught, and trust for the best. I am following up the clue of the gun, and believe that it only requires a little persuasion to get some really important evidence from one of the beaters, but more of this to-morrow. You must sleep now, Head. You must sleep. The shock I had undergone, and the intense pain in my arm, which began about this time to come on, told even upon my strong frame. Defrayer poured out a sleeping draught which the doctor had sent round. I drank it off, and soon afterwards he left me. An hour or two passed. At the end of that time the draught began to take effect. Drowsiness stole over me, the pain grew less, and I fell into an uneasy sleep, broken with hideous and grotesque dreams. From one of these I awoke with a start, struck a match, and looked at my watch. It was half-past three. The house, of course, had long ago retired to rest, and everything was intensely still. I could hear in the distance the monotonous ticking of the great clock in the hall, but no other sound reached my ears. My feverish brain, however, was actively working. The phantasmagoria of my dream seemed to take life and shape. Fantastic forms seemed to hover round my bed, and faces sinister with evil appeared to me. Each one bore a likeness to Madame Colucci. I became more and more feverish, and now a deadly fear that even at this moment something awful was happening began to assail me. It rose to a conviction— Madame, with her almost superhuman knowledge, must guess that she was in danger. Surely she would not allow the night to go by without acting? Surely, while we were supposed to sleep, she would steal the Rocheville diamond and escape? The horror of this thought was so overpowering that I could stay still no longer. I flung off the bedclothes and sprang from the bed. A delirious excitement was consuming me. Putting on my dressing-gown, I crept out onto the landing. Then I silently went down the great staircase, crossed the hall, and turning to the left went down another passage to the door of the stone stairs leading to the vault in which was Carlton's strong-room. I had no sooner reached this door than my terrors and nervous fears became certainties. A gleam of light broke the darkness. I drew back into a recess in the stonework. Yes, I was right. My terrors and convictions of coming peril had not visited me without cause, for standing before the iron door of the strong-room was Madame Colucci herself. There was a lighted taper in her hand. My bare feet had made no noise, and she was unaware of my presence. What was she doing? I waited in silence. My temples were hot and throbbing with overmastering horror. I listened for the bells which would give the alarm directly she inserted the key in the iron door. She was doing something to the safe. I could tell this by the noise she was making. Still no bells rang. The next instant the heavy door slipped back on its hinges, and Madame entered. The moment I saw this, I could remain quiet no longer. I sprang forward, striking my wounded arm against something in the darkness. She turned and saw me. I made a frantic effort to seize her. Then my brain swam, and every atom of strength left me. I found myself falling upon something hard. I had entered the strong room. For a moment I lay on the floor, half stunned. Then I sprang to my feet, but I was too late. 
the iron door closed upon me with a muffled clang. Madam had by some miraculous means opened the safe without a key, had taken the diamond from Mrs. Carlton's jewel-case, which stood open on a shelf, and had locked me a prisoner within. Half delirious and stunned, I had fallen an easy victim. I shouted loudly, but the closeness of my prison muffled and stifled my voice. How long I remained in captivity I cannot tell. The pain in my arm, much increased by my sudden fall on the hard floor, rendered me, I believe, partly delirious. I was feeling faint and chilled to the bone when the door of the strong-room at last was opened and Carlton and Dufrayer entered. I noticed immediately that there was daylight outside. The night was over. "'We have been looking for you everywhere,' said Dufrayer. "'What in the name of fortune has happened? How did you get in here?' "'In pursuit of Madame,' I replied. "'But where is she? For heaven's sake, tell me quickly.' "'Bolted, of course,' said Dufrayer, in a gloomy voice. "'But tell us what this means, Head. You shall hear what we have to say afterwards.' I told my story in a few words. "'But how, in the name of all that's wonderful, did she manage to open the safe without a key?' cried Carlton. "'This is black art with a vengeance.' "'You must have left the strong-room open,' I said. "'That I will swear I did not,' he replied. "'I locked the safe as usual, after showing it to you and to Freyer yesterday. Here is the key.' "'Let me see it,' I said. He handed it to me. I took it over to the light. "'Look here,' I cried, with sudden excitement. "'This cannot be your original key. It must have been changed. You think you locked the safe with this key. Carlton, you have been tricked by that arch-fiend. Did you ever before see a key like this?' I held the wards between my finger and thumb, and turned the barrel from left to right. The barrel revolved in the wards in a ratchet concealed in the shoulder. "'You could unlock the safe with this key, but not lock it again,' I exclaimed. "'See here.' I inserted the key in the keyhole as I spoke. It instantly started the bells ringing. The barrel turns, but the wards which are buried in the keyhole do not turn with it, and the resistance of the ratchet gives exactly the impression as if you were locking the safe. Thus, Yesterday morning you thought you locked the safe with this key, but in reality you left it open. No one but that woman could have conceived such a scheme. In some way she must have substituted this for your key. "'Well, come to your room now, Head,' cried Dufrayer, "'or Madame will have achieved the darling wish of her heart, and your life will be the forfeit.' I accompanied Carlton upstairs, dressed, and though still feeling terribly ill and shaken, presently joined the rest of the household in one of the sitting-rooms. The utmost excitement was apparent on every face. Mrs. Carlton was standing near an open window. There were traces of tears on her cheeks, and yet her eyes, to my astonishment, betokened both joy and relief. She beckoned me to her side. "'Come out with me for a moment, Mr. Head.' When we got out into the open air, she turned to me. "'Dreadful as the loss of the diamond is,' she exclaimed, "'there are few happier women in England than I am at the present moment.' My maid brought me a letter from Madame Colucci this morning, which has assuaged my worst fears. In it she owns that Count Porcelli has been long in his grave, and that she only blackmailed me in order to secure large sums of money. I was just about to reply to Mrs. Carlton, when Dufrayer hurried up. "'The detectives have arrived, and we want you at once,' he exclaimed. I accompanied him into Carlton's study. Tyler and Ford were both present. They had just been examining the strong-room, and had seen the false key." Their excitement was unbounded. "'She has bolted, but we will have her now,' cried Ford. "'We have got the evidence we want at last. It is true she has the start of us by three or four hours, but at last, yes, at last, we can loose the hounds in full pursuit.'" End of chapter 8